morning, church. Nice to see you. Thanks for bringing your Bibles with you. Our text uh, this morning is found in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 17. If you don't have your Bibles, that's okay. We'll project the words on the screen. This is a remarkable event in the life of Jesus. He takes his executive committee, Peter, James, and John, up on a high mountain where he is transfigured before them. It's awesome. We want to get some insight. Remember, this uh, summer we're using the KISS method. method. We're keeping it simple for the summer series. Uh, someone says it means short services. And I said, no, not necessarily short, just simple. And so, so uh, we are talking about Jesus. If you did not hear the message two weeks ago, what makes Jesus so special? Would you go online, get, get the podcast, get a CD, listen to that? Really foundational, very important, I think. Today we want to just... Uh, Suggest only Jesus as our subject. Matthew 17, as is our custom here, we're going to invite you to stand as you're able to hear God's word. Matthew 17, beginning at verse 1 through 8. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said, don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. May God inspire us today through this important word. You may be seated. Are you a positive person? Optimistic? Hope so. Glass half full? Or you tend toward the other direction, glass half empty? Heard the story about a optimist who had a pessimist friend. He was very concerned about him. And the optimist was thinking of ways that he could encourage his pessimist friend to be more positive. And uh, the optimist uh, actually had a dog that could walk on water. And so he thought one way he could encourage his pessimist friend was invite his friend to go duck hunting. And so he got his dog and his pessimistic friend out in a boat in the middle of the lake. And before long, the optimist had brought down a duck and he told the dog to go get it. The dog jumped out of the boat, walked on top of the water, over to the duck, picked it up, walked all the way back on top of the water, jumped back in the boat. Optimus looked at his pessimist friend. He said, what do you think about that? Pessimist looked down at the dog, looked at his friend. He said, that dog can't swim, can he? <laughs> it's possible. It's possible to miss the point isn't it? And remain pessimistic. Today we want to just uh, look at this amazing event in the life of Jesus when he took these three guys, his three closest companions, Peter, James, and John, up on the mountain. Now before uh, we get into this, uh, this text and just kind of work through verse by verse like we did last week, kind of an expository style, verse by verse, I want to tell you a story. A few years ago, I got on an airplane in Dayton, Ohio, which I often did two or three times a year to go to Atlanta for meetings of a board of directors for a mission agency there. And I got on the plane, and I was assigned a seat next to a young man, um, maybe right out of high school, maybe just in college, 19, 20 years old, something like that. And uh, we exchanged pleasantries. Hi, how are you doing? And he wanted to chat a bit. And he said, you know, uh, where are you from? I said, well, from Muncie. Where are you going? Well, I'm going to Atlanta. Uh, you got business in Atlanta? Well, you know, I'm on, a, on the board of a mission agency there, and so that's why I'm going down there. So, oh, what do you do? And that's a question I don't enjoy because you know how it goes with preachers, and you, you tell someone, oh, I'm a preacher, and then suddenly the whole thing gets weird, and people start acting funny, and <laughs> you know, it's not comfortable for me. And I, I don't like it, so I try to avoid the question if I can and get into the relationship as deep as I can before they find out, find out what I'm really up to. And so this kid, 
kid asked me the question, what do you do? And I thought, well, look, I don't want to talk to him. And so I'll just tell him what I am. Maybe that'll just discourage him. I said, well, I'm a Methodist preacher. And he went, oh, man. Well, that's just it. He said, listen, I'm a PK. I'm a preacher's kid. And I've had religion shoved down my throat my whole life. And I don't want to, if you want to talk about church, then you got the wrong guy. I don't talk to anybody about church. I said, great. I thought, I don't want to talk to you either. So we're all even. <laughs> And I thought, well, I'll just, just nudge him one more time, and this will probably shove him all the way away, so I don't have to worry about him. And so I said, you know, look, I'll tell you what, I'm not conversive on a lot of subjects. You know, I have kind of a narrow band of things I can talk about. And uh, I promise I won't mention the church if you don't, but would you mind if we talked about Jesus? And I thought, well, he, you know, that'll, that'll sour him completely. He looked at me and he said, all right, it's a deal. He said, a matter of fact, I got a lot of questions I want to ask you about that. And so for an hour and 20 minutes, talk to this guy about Jesus. Now, he didn't have any big spiritual breakthroughs with God, and he didn't resolve his issues with his dad, which I think were the main parts. But it was interesting. This was kind of a, kind of a glimpse a handful of years ago of uh, kind of an example of something that I was experiencing intuitively at the time and have subsequently read a lot about and, and heard a lot about, and that is what's happening in our culture today with regard to people and their attitudes about Jesus and their attitudes about the church, and especially in, uh, with the emergent culture, this postmodern, post-Christian culture. This boy, I think, demonstrated for me what many people's lives are manifesting today, which is an anger and disillusionment towards religious things, and at the same time, a real fondness for Jesus. You ask someone, what do you think about the church? And it's often, often a negative answer. But you ask someone, what do you think about Jesus? And you often hear things like admire, respect, believe in, esteem, have good feelings toward. And it's interesting. I don't think people are actually angry with God so much as they are just disillusioned with the church. There's a disconnect between what is done in organized religion and the person they believe Jesus to be. So you can easily find persons who dislike the church. Not hard at all. And you will be hard-pressed, though, on the other hand, to find anyone who doesn't like Jesus. It's an interesting thing. And, 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 and as you get older, th these are confusing <laughs> uh, realities. And so people ask the question, well, why, why is it that people like Jesus, but they don't like the church? You know, they like Jesus, but they don't like me as a Christian person. And the answer to the question is really quite simple. The explanation is this. Jesus is perfect, and we are not. Jesus never disappoints. He never disillusions. He never fails. We do all of that stuff all the time. And so it's easy to see how people could form a worldview that says Jesus is okay and Christian and the, and the church, not so much. Now, what I want to remind you about is that the Bible is clear regarding our relationship with the church. If you're a follower of Jesus, then the Bible is very clear about the expectations created for you as a person who follows Jesus. And that is you are to be connected in community with other people who follow Jesus. And the church is the only example we have of this. And so the church is something that God calls us to, to belong to, to associate with, to put down roots, relational roots with, and to be in, involved with. Now, that may not be, be uh, something that's particularly tasteful to you, but it's actually necessary. You know, the Bible says, uh, forbid not the assembling of yourselves together as the habit of some, but, but encourage one another as long as it's still today. And, and, and so we have this scriptural mandate that says God calls us together. In community. In fact, we know not only does God call us into, into the church, but we know that Jesus loves the church. And this dichotomy that exists today in a culture where people say, I like Jesus, but I, I hate the church, is not like Jesus at all. Because we're described in the, in the Bible as the bride of Christ or the body of Christ. I mean, what person doesn't, you know, protect their body and take care of their body, you know, and serve their body. I mean, there, and there's, there are just things that you do when it's your body or it's your bride. My wife's out of town this weekend. She's at a family wedding. And, and 
imagine, if you will, she was standing next to me, say, after a service some morning, and she's there, and she's a perfect delight, and if you know her, you love her, and she's wonderful. And what if someone walked up to me and said to me, you know, Greg, you're just the greatest thing ever. I love you. You're so inspiring. I love this church. I just love everything about it. Thank you. Thank you. And Beth is standing right there next to me, and then the person turns to her and says, I don't like you. Uh, you're annoying to me. In fact, you're offensive to me. I don't like your attitude. I don't like your style. I don't like your look. I don't like anything about you. In fact, you're just a real disappointment to me. Now, how'd that feel? How's that work for you? Now, if someone did that, actually did that, I might be tempted to take my What Would Jesus Do bracelet off and just <laughs> punch you in the nose. Because... Because you've just insulted my bride. This is my wife. I don't let anyone speak to her that way. That, not in my presence, or not if I find out about it. We don't have that. This is, this, is my, this is my lovely wife. And so you can understand then that with regard to Jesus, when you say, Jesus, I love you, you're great, you're all that, but that church of yours, hmm, I don't think so. You can understand why that would be offensive to Jesus. Here's what I believe. I believe that the more in love with Jesus you become, the more in love with the church you'll be. F flaws and warts and f foibles and messes and disappointments and all. The more like Jesus you become, the more in love with the people of God you'll be. You all right with that? Now, I'm just laying some foundation there. I'm not, so what I'm saying is, here's, what, here's reality. This is culture. Postmodernism, post Christian culture says Jesus is okay, the church is not. And that may be true, but that's not good. It, it, may, be, it may be true, but it's not right. Because the Bible teaches us that we should love Jesus and love his people, and that we should be all in with, with both. All right, now that's just a little foundation. Now, how can, how can we accomplish this, this life together and journey together? focused on Jesus and his people. Well, here's, here's some things we can learn from this text. Jesus takes these three guys up on this mountain. He gets there and he says, all right, you guys stay right here. I'm going to go over there for a while. You guys stay right here. I'll go right over there. And Jesus walks several paces away from them, probably raised his hands, lifted his, his face, and the next instant, pow! And I mean, big pow! Whomp! Like that. And Jesus is suddenly transfigured before them. Where before he's just an average guy in an average earth suit wearing normal clothes. And now he's stepped a few paces away and the radiant glory of God has transformed this guy. His face shines like the sun. His eyes are like fiery coal. His clothes, which were just routine before, now radiates with the light of God's glory. He's transformed before them. And it just astonishes them. And then it also says, and transfigured before them, suddenly Moses and Elijah is with Jesus in conversation. Moses and Elijah, now grouped up with Jesus over there in that radiation zone. Now here's my question. How did they know it was Moses and Elijah? These are questions that come to occur to my mind. I, my mind sometimes goes to funny places. This isn't a major point. I'm just curious if you would help me, because they're not, there's no, it's not mentioned how they know. We know they know, because Peter immediately responds to, to Jesus by saying, "This is all. This is okay. We're going to build a build a big big memorial here." How did they know it was Moses and Elijah? I mean, this wasn't a church growth convention. They weren't wearing name tags. How do they know? <laughs> Here's my speculation. They are in the middle of a spiritual hurricane. The glory of God is radiating all around them. And so suddenly they are in an environment of spiritual revelation. Jesus is actually appearing as he is in the resplendent glory of God. Moses and Elijah right next to him. 
So they're, they're, they're in one sense, they're seeing reality. And, and my speculation about how they knew it was Moses and Elijah is they just knew. They just knew. Because they're in the environment of revelation. I think that's what heaven's going to be like. You can have a smartphone right now and ask any question in the world and get an answer in about 10 seconds. I mean, literally. You can get any answer. In heaven, you won't have to wait 10 seconds because it'll be an environment of revelation. Wonder what that... Oh. What about that question? Oh. I already know. Because you're in a, an environment of the revelation presence of Almighty God who knows everything. It's kind of an interesting moment, isn't it? Well, Peter, as we work our way through these, these verses... Peter now is captivated by the whole thing. Peter is a little unique. Uh, unfortunately, I identify with Peter in some of the negative ways. He's, he's, he's just impulsive. He's impetuous. He stands up when everyone else is sitting down. He speaks out when, when you should be quiet. He's always taking his, his sandaled foot and sticking it in his mouth. He's just always just a little bit off. He's, he's happy. He's enthusiastic. He loves a party, but he just kind of misses it. And this is one of those moments. Jesus, Moses, and Elijah there, glorified in front of them. And, and, Peter, and, and, and Peter goes, wow, this is great. God, this is great. This is awesome. This is amazing. God, this is so great. We've never seen anything like this. He's jabbing James and John, check, can you see, look at that, I've never seen anything, this is awesome. And then he says, Jesus, here's what we're going to do, we're going to build some stuff, we're going to make a memorial here, uh, one for Moses, one for Elijah, one for, we'll put you in the middle, right there, center stage, put one, right, a tabernacle right there for you, it'll be, it'll be a, a historic monument, we'll, we'll, we'll sell tickets, it's like a museum, it'll be awesome. Don't you love it? Don't you love it when, when someone is trying to explain to God what's happening? Peter's explaining to Jesus how special this moment is and what he's going to do as a result of it. And it's not right. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you love to be able to, to identify more with the ethereal, intellectual John, you know, this young disciple whom Jesus loves, you know, the one God entrusted the revelation to, all this drama and symbolism and epic. and Just, you can imagine, being around John would just be a, uh, or uh, maybe St. Luke, you know, the physician. You know, wise, intelligent, a healer. What a, you know, it'd be nice to identify with him. Or maybe St. Saint, Saint Paul, you know, the writer of two-thirds of the New Testament. Multilingual. Uh, multicultural, sophisticated, cosmopolitan, intellectual, academic. Wouldn't you just, just connect with him? He's awesome. Instead, you know, pretty much I find myself understanding Peter best. <laughs> and, you know, for example, one day they're, they're gliding in the disciples in a boat onto the shore of Galilee. Peter sees Jesus on the shore. He can't wait for the boat to get there. He strips down to his underwear, dives in, and just, you know, outraces the boat to the shore just so he can get there first. This is Peter. And he says, God, this is awesome. Jesus, here's what we're going to do. We're going we're to build you something here to memorialize this event. This is historic. No one's ever seen anything like this before. This is awesome. And so there he is. And imagine, imagine the conversation. The Bible says that Jesus, Moses, and Elijah were in conversation. The record of that conversation is not included in the text, so we don't know what they're talking about. But can you imagine what they're talking about. This is Moses, the lawgiver deliverer of Israel. This is the guy who, who had a special tent. He called the tent of meeting. You know, there's a tabernacle, big tent in the middle of the wilderness where, the, where the community worship took place. But he had a separate tent from that called the tent of meeting. And only Moses was allowed to go into that thing. And he met with God there. One, one time when, when Moses' sister was in trouble with God, God reminded Moses' sister, he said, listen, Moses is the guy I meet with face to face. I talk to him like a man talks to his friend. I wouldn't be messing with him. Moses saw God and lived. He met with God face to face. So this is an important guy. And Elijah, think about him. He's, he's a prophet and maybe the dean of the prophets. God used Elijah to raise the dead. 
This guy, this guy has some credentials. He's got a pedigree. So these guys are there, and they're having a conversation. And you can only, well, you probably can't imagine the nature of their conversation. It's got to be amazing. And so Peter gets caught up in this moment. And so he's decided the right thing to do. Peter then says to Jesus, look, we're going to make these tabernacles, and we're going to put you right in the center. You'll be center stage. And you can almost hear Jesus saying, well, thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. I'd like to accept this award. Um, I'd like to first thank my mother, uh, without whom I would not be here. And I'd like to thank Ezra, my first grade teacher, who was a godly man, saintly man, and uh, first taught me about Moses and about Elijah. And so thank, thank you all very much for this prestigious award. Well, as if what was happening wasn't enough, we find in verse 5, now a boiling cloud of God's manifest presence, the radiant glory of God in cloud form, now boils onto the top of that mountain. We don't know. It said it came over them. We don't know if it stopped right there or if it started, once it got to maybe head level, then it came down a little bit further. What would your instinct be? If you have the boiling, radiant glory of God and now a vo God's voice coming out of the cloud. <laughs> Peter's, Peter's going... Well, now what we're going to do, this is what's going on, God, and this is, what, this is how we're going to handle it. And now this cloud, and Peter's in mid-sentence. See, while he was still speaking, this cloud boils in, and the voice of Almighty God from the cloud. And basically, this is the translation of what God said. First he said, Peter, shut up. Would you shut up? Just shut up. What are you thinking? What are you doing? You're going to miss the whole point. You're not even close. Shut up. <laughs> this is my son, whom I love, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Listen to him. In other words, you don't need to be talking. You need to be listening. You're missing the whole idea. You're missing the whole point. Now, what does he mean? Yeah. He means that Jesus is not just another prophet. He's not just another priest. He's not an, another teacher, someone with supernatural capacity. Almighty God is saying, this is my son. This is my son. So the centrality of Christ in this moment doesn't mean he is the best among equals, that he should be somehow center to Moses and Elijah. It means that he's all there is. He, this is my son. He's Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. He's the author and the foundation of our faith. He's the cornerstone which was rejected by the builders. He's everything of everything. He is all in all. He is all there is. He's it with none other. This is the voice of God saying, listen to my son. Perhaps you've uh, seen church services or been in one where the pastor preacher might give an invitation for people to take a step. I do this all the time, you know. Think about God. Take a step toward him. Take a step toward Jesus. Take your next step and say yes to whatever God's asking of you because he loves you and has a great design for your life. And so you hear these invitations given. Sometimes in the context of those invitations, you may hear someone like me say something like, make Jesus the center of your life. You know, put him, put him there in the most important spot. And, you know, the... The, the idea is okay, but it presupposes something. Just to use the phrase, put, make Jesus the center of your life. It presupposes that we have somehow ordered the details of our lives, and we're willing to put Jesus in the center of that. You know, it's almost like we've, we've built the cabinet for our trophy case, and we've displayed all of the important pieces of our life, and we ask Jesus to come and sit among them. Center, but among them. And what God is doing on the Mount of Transfiguration to Peter and therefore to us is reminding us that Jesus won't be central in your life. 
He won't be second or third. He won't be any of those things. He is all there is. He, it's only Jesus. He is my son. I love him. Listen to him. You know, those of us who, who might get close enough to God to actually invite Jesus into some part of our life, I mean, we don't invite him into the bad stuff of our life. I mean, come on, Jesus, come and sit in my dysfunction or my addiction or my bad attitude or, or my poor work, work, work ethic. You know, God, you know, I'm lazy. Jesus, come, lazy, just, can't we just we're next to my lazy. We don't invite Jesus there. What we do is we presuppose this arrangement in the trophy case. We say, okay, Lord, here's my spouse. Here's my family. Here's my good job. Here's my future. Here's my home. Here are my plans. Here are my vacations. Here's my retirement travel. All these beautiful things. And I know that you're going to feel honored to come and sit at the center place of all these details of my life. All the while, God says, this is my son. The stone cut without hands slices through the universe and crosses through all the dimensions of space and time and with great force cuts through all the presuppositions of our lives. We presume to know where God fits in our lives and God says, you don't have any idea if you think that Jesus is just someone to set in the center of your life. God says to us either... Either I am Lord of all in your life or I'm not Lord at all. Either I'm everything in your life or I am nothing. Jesus will not squeeze himself into your life, even the center of your life. Most people who have tried to walk with God for a while can resonate with this. I've I've been walking with Jesus now for 42 years. And Folks who are in this kind of category, you know, you've been around a while, maybe you're raised in church, that sort of thing. Most people don't lose their passion for Christ because of sinful activities. Most don't. But because we fill our lives with so many good things that we lose the dynamic joy of the best. Are you listening this morning? We don't lose touch with Jesus because of sinful bad things so much as we do the dynamic joy of the best. I'm going to put this statement on the screen. Maybe it'll sink in a little bit more. It's easy to lose Jesus in the good things of life. Nod your head like you know that's true. It's easy to do that, to lose Jesus in the good things. The second half of verse 5, God says, listen to him. This, see, this is, this is the, the age of information technology. There are times in my house, maybe your house, where I have the TV on, the iPod, the iPad, and the iPhone all on at the same time, all at once. And there is noise and voices and sound and impulse. And why is that? Well, first of all, the technology is available, and it's just easy, and so that's what we do. But there's another thing that contributes to it that many of us cannot stand the thought of being alone and quiet with ourselves. Can't stand it. We live in an age that despises solitude and quiet reflection, despises it. I mean, if there's there's nothing, nothing filling the room, filling your ears, for three seconds, we reach for something. There's got to be sound. There's got to be noise. There's got to be information. There's got to be something. There's got to be impulse into my life. We live in an age that despises solitude. Therefore, you have to fight for it if you're going to get it. Otherwise, listen, Jesus' voice will begin to sound like all the other voices in the pipeline, and you'll not be able to differentiate the voice of voices. Jesus can begin to look like Moses and Elijah, and he's not like Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah can't carry his sandals. Moses and Elijah are a couple of guys. Jesus is the Son of God, the pre-existent, co-eternal Word. He is God Almighty. And He's distinct. And He won't take a second place. Won't even fit Himself into your life in a central place. I love the prissy language of the King James. It says, they were sore afraid. Verse 6, they were sore afraid. Love that phrase. Translation, scared the stink out of them. Just scared, just scared them. Imagine this uh, glory cloud now coming down, 
can you, can you, if you, if the, if the radiant glory, tangible manifestation of the glory of God came rolling into this room right now, came rolling in, maybe just like this, began tumbling, boiling like this, and started moving toward people up in the mezzanine, you know what would happen? People in the mezzanine would start going like this. And then they'd jump out of their seats and they'd lay down on the floor or start running for the stairs to try to get down underneath it. And if, then it, se- it started settling like this and just started coming down where we are. Can you imagine the tangible presence of God just coming now toward your head? You've heard people in the mezzanine starting to scream when it envelops them. You hear noises that don't sound quite right. And now it's coming down like this. What's your instinct? Your instinct is to get lower, get smaller, get lower. Shoot, and what if it's, what if it's th- now three feet off the ground? Where are you? Standing there going, ooh, this is something. That's not what you're doing. You're down low. You're on the ground. And now if the voice of Almighty God comes out and says, Pay better attention when you're in church or something like that. <laughs> you'd, be, you'd be going, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm your guy. I'm Mr. Attentive. You can imagine Peter, James, and John. Now they are, they are scared out of their, their minds. And they're down on the ground. And you can imagine them perhaps covering their heads, their faces like this. And they are maybe in the fetal position, maybe holding on to each other. And they're just going, oh, and they just assume that in the next instant, they are going to be consumed. They are in the presence of Almighty God, and they know this is the end. There is this tension that exists in our lives, isn't there, friends, when we have this instinct, this desire to get close to God, to have intimacy in our relationship with God. I mean, on one hand, you say, what if the presence of Almighty God actually tangibly appeared in the room? How cool would that be? Well, there is a sense in which that's appealing, isn't it? That you could get close to God and that in touch with God and that intimate with God. And that's, on one level, that's really exciting and something that you would long for. You want that. But on the other hand, there's, there's, this, is where the, this is where the confusion would come because on the other hand, if God's presence was actually tangibly present, the, f- the first thought that human beings have, I think, is I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to be in God's presence. This is a holy God. Awesome. Remember, Isaiah had this experience. He had an epiphanal revelation of God. He saw God on the throne, the train of his robe filling the temple, cherubim, you know, seraphim, you know, fiery ones, you know, declaring his glory, the whole building shaking, the glory cloud of God. Isaiah saw this. What was his first reaction? He says, whoa, woe is me. Woe, 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 which means I am unworthy. I am undone. I am unfit. I am going to die. Woe. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the glory of God. I am finished. (laughs) And we get that, don't we? We get that moment when our instinct to get intimate with God and close to Jesus is somehow counterbalanced by this reality, this awareness that says, you know, even if I got really close to God, I'm not fit to be in his presence. I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy of that. I, I'm, I'm not going to live. And we get that. We understand that dynamic. But the, the, the neat thing that happens in this text is we find Jesus now going over to the boys who are in this whimpering, quivering mass on the ground. And, and we hear Jesus go over to them, says to Peter, James, and John, he says, now look at me. In other words, Peter, take your hands away from your face because Peter's just sure in the next instant he's done. He's going to dissolve in the presence of God. He'll just be obliterated because he knows, well, we can't tolerate this. Jesus says to him, look up here at me. And you can see Peter slowly and carefully 
pulling his hands away from his face and looking up at Jesus. And Jesus said, get up now. Don't be afraid. Can you feel that? Everyone in this room unworthy, unfit, undeserving. But Jesus looking at you saying, don't be afraid. I understand. Now come on. Jesus looked at those guys and said, do you, do you see any anger in my eyes? Do you see any bitterness? Do you see any judgment? No. Only love and acceptance and forgiveness. My grace sufficient for you. What a verse says helps us. What a verse doesn't say sometimes helps us. Our last verse, verse 8, it says simply this. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. We don't know if Moses and Elijah were still there. We don't know if the glory cloud of God was still, you know, still lingering. We don't know. All we know is what the verse says, which is, when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. Now I want to put a statement on the screen. Just tie this all up. Victorious Christian living. Victorious Christian living in the 21st century is not about obeying the rules. Because the rules have never worked, which flies in the face of so many who think that the key to influencing the postmodern culture is to restate the rules. We just gotta, we gotta get these kids and we gotta tell them what's right from wrong. They don't seem to be able to understand that. We've gotta, we've gotta make it clear. We've gotta instruct them. We've gotta lay the law down. We've gotta, we just gotta, you know, redraw the, the parameters. We've gotta make it clear. We've gotta, we've gotta work at it. And I wanna say again, the rules have never worked. Now, people should get forthright guidance with unconditional love. I mean, that's part of the process. That's right, and I get it. But listen, victorious Christian living in the 21st century is not about obeying the rules. It's about falling in love again. Young people, middle-aged people, old people, listen to me. The key to a victorious Christian life, whether you've been a Christian for three days or 30 years, the key to a victorious Christian life is to fall in love with Jesus, to have eyes only for him, to have eyes only for him so that you have eyes for nothing else or no one else, that he alone is the focal point of your life. He is your life. He is your, your hope. He is your source. He is your everything. He is your all in all. That's the key. That's how you get there. That's what the Mount of Transfiguration was about. This is my son, whom I love, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When they looked up, they saw no one but Jesus. Now, you may be in the room today and you say, look, I've seen a lot in my life. I've experienced a lot. I've seen many things, good and bad. You know, and I'm a, I'm a little older than you, Pastor, and maybe I've seen some things you haven't even imagined before, and it's easy for you to talk about that because I've seen, I've seen pain and disappointment I've seen war and famine and pestilence. I've seen the worst of the worst. Okay. You've seen it. I know what you've seen at the beginning of the 21st century. You've seen terrorism and death. We've all seen that. My question to you today is, have you seen Jesus? Have you seen him walk on the water? Have you seen him deliver the demoniac with a word? Have you seen him touch the deaf cause them to hear? Have you seen him calm the raging storm? Say the woman caught in adultery, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Have you seen Jesus? Have you seen his gentleness, his love, his grace? Have you seen his power? Have you seen his awesome grandeur? Have you seen Jesus? I know you've seen the world. I know you've seen the ugliness. I know you've seen people suffer. I know you've seen yourself offended and grieved and pained. I know that. And maybe some of you have seen bad things. I heard a preacher say something one time and it just hurt people. And I saw the church do something and it grieved people and grieved God and hurt people. Okay, great. That's nothing new. You can see that any day of the world. My question to you today is have you seen Jesus? Have you seen him? Maybe you're a person in the room today and when I ask you the question, have you seen Jesus? You go, I've never even looked for him. Well, maybe it's time to stop and look. 
And the way you find Jesus is by simply saying, Lord, I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong. And I thank you that you made a way for me. That you actually lived a perfect life and died a sacrificial death so that all the wrongs that I've accumulated in my life could be resolved. And so thank you for forgiving me of the things I've done wrong. And please come and live in my life. That's, that's how you see Jesus for the first time. And let me ask the rest of you this question. Was there ever a time in your life when you saw him more clearly and directly than you do now? And could I challenge you to refocus your gaze on him? When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. Could I just remind you, he's not the... He's not the center of life. He is life. He's not walking along the way. He is the way. He's not pointing to the truth. He is truth. Christians and churches will disappoint, disillusion, but Jesus never goes away. He never leaves us bankrupt. He never leaves our side. Have you seen Jesus? And then there's someone in the room, inevitably, right now, and you say, Pastor Greg, you don't know me. You don't know my story. You don't know what I've done. You don't know my failures. You don't know my sins. You don't know how hard I've tried to live a Christian life, but I can't do it. I'm too weak. I'm too flawed. I'm too wounded. I'm too damaged. I can't do it. So that's just it. Well, let me just say to you, nobody's impressed with your sin. Nobody's impressed with your failure. Because let me tell you something. Everybody's a failure. Everybody messes up. Everybody sins. You may have made a bigger pile than the next guy, but everybody, all of us, I know it, you know it, we all know it. We've all seen our own sin. We've seen it rampant in our lives. We've seen it on a field of purple with spotlights on it. We get it. We understand failure. We've seen it. That's not the question this morning. The question is, have you seen Jesus? Have you seen him? Because he's the answer. He's the answer for all that. He's how all that gets resolved. I'm convinced that the first thing I'm going to say when I get to heaven is, what's a person like me doing in a place like this? I mean, really. And the next thought I'm going to have is, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Because there's no way a person like me could have ever ended up in a place like this without help. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. Only Jesus. Did you get it? That's the point. There it is. I hope you've heard it. Would you bow your heads with me? Let's pray. Lord, remind us this morning, the road to victory is by seeing Jesus and falling in love with him. I pray for anyone in the room today who doesn't know him, doesn't know you, I pray, God, that you would help them to take the right step to see you as their hope and their life. For the rest of us, oh God, when I asked the question a moment ago, was there ever a time in your life when you saw him more clearly and directly than you do right now? I imagine there's a number of us who could say yes. Could I encourage you, friends, put him back in focus? Not in the center of all the other stuff, but to him alone in focus, to see him for who he is and the utter fulfillment and joy and peace that he alone can bring. Say yes to him, friends. Only Jesus. So meet us now, we pray, oh God. Thank you for your grace, your love, your acceptance, your forgiveness. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. In his name we pray. And the people said, would you stand as we sing?